Mr. Speaker, and may I advise the House that uh, I will be sharing my time today with my colleague from Scarborough, Guildwood. Uh, to be clear, Liberals will uh, support the motion that's before the House today in the context of an increasingly risky situation globally and growing economic inequality domestically. The Premiers believe that it would be useful to have a national economic summit. They will hold one in November and they've invited the Prime Minister to attend. Indeed, he should be there. The government has been far too arbitrary, far too unilateral in dealing with other orders of government within the Federation. On energy, the environment, employment insurance, immigration, health care, pensions, the criminal law, and so forth, the provinces have asked for collaboration, and this government has repeatedly turned its back. That is no way to run the Federation, Mr. Speaker. It breeds ill will and distrust, and that should stop. So on the all-consuming topic of the economy, yes, the Prime Minister should show up in Halifax in November. We need a fully coordinated Team Canada approach to economic recovery and growth. And to get that, it helps if people can sit down at the same table and share their perspectives in a constructive way. On that score, Mr. Speaker, the leader of the NDP could take some lessons on getting along with provincial leaders. His first foray into federal provincial relations was widely perceived as an attack on Western Canada. He didn't express himself in terms of conciliation or cooperation. It was all about confrontation and conflict. He set the resources sector against manufacturing. He set Western jobs against, against Eastern jobs. He described a zero-sum game in which if the West wins, then the East must lose, and vice versa. And that's a mugs game. You don't earn friends and build cooperation in Western Canada by depicting our economy in that region as a disease. And when the Western Premiers expressed their dismay, when the, pre when the Western Premiers expressed their dismay, the leader of the NDP went further on the, offense, on the offensive. He dismissed them as mere messengers for the Prime Minister. Now, that truly is insulting. Worse still, he said, and I quote, I am not responding to any of them, end of quote. In other words, the Premiers are just not worth his time. That is what the leader of the NDP said. It's all on the public record. And now he is promoting meetings with the Premiers as a great step forward. This is either a huge example of hypocrisy or a conversion on the road to Damascus of historic proportions. But the object here, Mr. Speaker, is not the leader of the NDP. The object is the Prime Minister, and he should be in Halifax in November. Apart from our Canadian banking system, which the right-wing Reform Alliance crowd wanted to compromise and give away to the Americans back in the 1990s, and thank goodness for Paul Martin and Jean Chrétien, who said no to that bad advice, and preserved for Canada the best banking system in the world. Apart from that, Canada has one other major global advantage in coping with international economic uncertainty. That advantage is our federal debt ratio. It stands at just under 35 percent, which is low by global standards. Back in the 1990s, it was a crippling 70 percent. Think of that. 70 percent of the gross domestic product was offset by the federal debt. The federal books had not been balanced in more than 25 years. The Canadian economy was a basket case. A candidate for honorary membership in the third world is how it was described by the international financial media. That's the situation that was faced by a Liberal government that was elected in 1993. We faced it and we fixed it. The books were balanced by 1997. We ushered in a whole decade of surplus budgets. The debt came down. We slashed that federal debt ratio in half. Taxes came down. Interest rates remained low and stable. The economy grew. More than three and a half million net new jobs were created. Employment insurance premiums were cut 13 years in a row. Transfer payments to the provinces were raised to an all-time record high and major investments were made in infrastructure, innovation, children, families, skills, and trade. In 2006, 
we left for our successors a strong economy and, in fact, the best fiscal record in the Western world. Sadly, the Conservatives Sadly, the Conservatives played fast and loose with that situation from the get-go, long before there was any recession to blame, and note that, Mr. Speaker, long before there was any recession to blame, they increased federal spending by three times the rate of inflation. They eliminated all the contingency reserves, all the prudence factors from the federal budget process, and they put the country back into deficit again before, not because of, but before the recession arrived in the fall of 2008. So once again, Canada is confronting serious economic challenges. Broadly speaking, these challenges are in two categories. One is very tepid economic growth overall, and the other is increasing inequality among Canadians. These are the priorities that should command the government's attention. But all Canadians hear from the government is that one note, monotone, conservative mantra about austerity, austerity, and yet more austerity, effectively kneecapping the federal government to make it as irrelevant as possible. So what else could the federal government do? As a start, they could help the most vulnerable low-income families, and they could do that in part by making their tax credits refundable to use the technical language of the tax department. In other words, the tax credits for children's sports, children's arts, for home caregivers, for volunteer firefighters, and so forth, would become equally available to all Canadians. Right now, they're structured in such a way that low-income people are effectively excluded. That should be fixed as a matter of fairness to, e to ease inequality. Another thing they could do is ease off their payroll tax increases. It seems unreasonable and counterproductive that they keep hiking EI premiums by about $600 million per year, every year, when job creation needs to be the priority. But EI payroll taxes keep going up under this government, $600 million per year, and that is a job-killing tax on jobs. They also need to back off on their new secret EI benefits clawback just introduced this past summer. It is a clear disincentive to employment. It unfairly punishes seasonal workers and others, and it contributes to inequality among Canadians. Mr. Speaker, those are just a few practical, affordable, doable things that this government could and should do right now. But let me conclude on a matter that could well benefit from some strong federal-provincial discussions. And that is the painful set of circumstances facing young Canadians. Unemployment among young people under the age of 25 remains at recession-like levels, close to 15%. 254,000 fewer young Canadians are employed today than before the recession in 2008. And another 165,000 have just stopped participating in the job market. They've given up. Among other things, Canada needs a big push in support of learning and skills across this country. From preschool to graduate studies, continuous high-caliber learning is vital to the strength of our economy and the well-being of our society. While respecting provincial jurisdiction over education, the Government of Canada needs to be more than an idle spectator when it comes to this key determinant of Canada's ability to succeed economically and Canadians' ability to live fulfilling lives. So much more should be done by an engaged and energetic federal government to partner with provinces and educational institutions to help make Canadians the best educated people in the world. We will thrive in a difficult global economy by the quality of our brain power. That is the key to productivity. So it is good public policy for the federal government to support early learning and child care, to support the removal of financial barriers to post-secondary studies and skills, the amelioration of student debt, and curiosity-based research and innovation. One final point, Mr. Speaker, and that is this government's obligation for Aboriginal education. Take the cap off of First Nations access 
to post-secondary education and fill in the gap between what the provinces pay on non-Aboriginal children and the much lower amount this government pays on Aboriginal children. Thank you. Question.